Right, good evening okay. everybody, or good morning, or good afternoon, depending where you're watching this and when you're watching this. Welcome to our second Hangout on Air that forms part of our migration shared endeavour. We are going to just have a little talk through our progress, or lack of progress, as some of us may or may not have made, and particularly concentrate on how we might illustrate some of our findings. So we have in the room Kim, who's made really good progress on her migration studies, and she's just going to talk through some of the things that she's done and some of the things she hasn't done. Please don't be discouraged by what she's done, because it is quite impressive, and if yours is less impressive, that's absolutely fine. Uh, it's just to give us all a few ideas. And the first thing we thought we would think about, really, is uh, how we might have planned our migration project and those of you who were following along on the on the um, suggestion sheets and also were at the first hangout that we had we talked about establishing some key questions for your own particular migration project and we we deliberately didn't suggest what those should be because I think each one place will need different key questions um, so Kim would you like to talk a little bit about how your ideas have changed in the few months since you started this? You bet. Um, I put this question on the um, forum originally, my research question, and uh, I was really interested in why my uh, parish declined so much in population in the latter half of the 19th century. Um, in particular, uh, it took a big drop from 1841 to 1851, and that's where I was going to start. So that's been my real interest in trying to find out not only you know who left, but why they left. And then it, I thought, well, if I get around to it, I'll try and figure out who came into the parish as well. Obviously, not as many as, as those who left, but uh, that's been turned out to be really interesting too. I think now that I've started working on it, I'm probably going to change my question a bit. And what I want to do is really easier to look at whole censuses at a time rather than just saying, trying to figure out just the people who've left rather than everybody who moved. So I'm just focusing right now on the period 1841 to 1861, and I'm just going to try and find out why did the population decline in that time and find out about all the first deaths and movements. Uh, into and out of the parish in that shorter, much shorter period, and kind of look at that those decades as a whole, and then move on to later years because I've got my hands pretty full. I don't know if others in the room uh, want to talk through their key research question and if they they're still sticking with that. <laughs> well, I don't. Um much to the point, but uh, um, I was actually into um, mid Wales. Uh, it's not really yielded much in the way of uh, migration. I haven't, it's one of the areas I haven't looked at in detail. So um, I've still to do a lot more work on that. Actually, that's interesting, Peter, because often a place where there is very little movement, there's a reason for that, and, and it may be that it's very isolated, or there's full employment and no one wants to go, and there's all sorts of other reasons, and it's really a good idea to try and compare that with a place where there is a lot of movement, and try and identify, perhaps, what's causing so many people to really love staying there. Um, sometimes it's to do with land tenure. And certainly if you've got long leases, then people are more likely to, to stick around a bit longer. Yeah. Um, Kim, Kim, do you want me to move on to the next? Your yeah, next that's fine. Picture. There you go. So when I, uh, I had Can my talk research, us through it? Yeah, I had my research question, and then I thought, okay, now what do I do with it? So we've, uh, we've raised these points in the inspiration list, but basics are that I want to, throughout the year, is build contextual understanding. 
we talked a little bit about what that means, and I'll show you uh, a little bit that I've done on it. Then I obviously want to identify who the migrants were and try and understand the reasons uh, for their migration into or out of the parish and, and why they chose the places to go that they did. And so I have some ideas on that. And then the, the once I get that data together, and I'll probably now do it by you know this shorter time frame. Once say I get together 1841 to 1861, I'll try and analyze that data and see if I can see any patterns and, and who was moving and why they were moving and where they were moving. And then before uh, the end of the project, I want to be sure and pull things together enough to be able to uh, publicize what I've found so we can share and compare with uh, others uh, what others are finding. So that was the basic plan, pretty, pretty straightforward steps. Uh, feel free to say if you think I'm missing some, some key components. <laughs> No, I think that looks brilliant, Kim. I mean, the key okay. component miss, missing for me is is time to do all this, isn't it, really? Yeah, uh, I, is. yeah I got a good start. I've had to uh, work on my local history course for the past month or month and a half, so I'm just getting back into it now, but it's, I'm really excited to get a little bit more time on it. Anyway, if you want to move on to yeah. the next part, Janet. Yeah. There you go. So what have I done so far? I, I, have, I went ahead and linked the 1841 census to the 1851 census to try and see who left the parish, who came into the parish, and I did the same for 1851 to 1861. And that's where I kind of ran into my uh, first problem is that, as you all know, 1841 is really not the greatest census for trying to link records. Uh, based on birth years and birthplaces, since <laughs> it just doesn't have um, good birth years and it doesn't have birthplaces essentially at all. So what I've now had to do, and it takes a long time, it takes me probably about five minutes to uh, link records. I've got it really easy because uh, in Devon, Find My Past has put up um, a lot of records online and, and I've got a number of good sources, but I found that I had to go back and get the and link to the baptism and, and parish register data in order to do a good linkage uh, with the 1841 census. And that it's it's not hard; it's just taking time. But as I say, find my past has a Devon record. The small handful of my guys who made it to Cornwall, I can find in the Cornwall OPC database. So and that's really helpful, um, and hopefully. Other people who are trying to do this sort of thing have put online access to the parish registers because I've found you really need to know that. But anyway, so I'm working through now linking in the parish register data and it's really improving my record linkage between the censuses. And that's about how far I've gotten. I have found, identified probably now too of maybe up to 80 or so overseas immigrants. Um, not necessarily, yeah, but in the 1841, 1861, or at least maybe into the early 1870s, um, of uh, people who've gone overseas as well. So I'm quite excited about that. And that's this my project. <laughs> um, roughly, how many? Do you know how many that you're unable to find at all, Kim? Or, yeah. or are you getting a fairly uh, yeah. high success rate, some way well, or another? I, when I did it, just trying to link 1841 to 1851 without kind of systematically using the parish registers, I would say that I was getting about 75 to 80 percent I was finding, because something like 60 percent were like born in the parish and 40 percent weren't by about 1841. But I wasn't, the linkages I was getting, my real problem was that I wasn't they were probable linkage, linkages. I wouldn't have called them really highly likely or definite linkages. Mm. And so the uh, getting the baptism records, and I'm getting about 75 to 80 percent. I'm finding the baptism records far, and since some of those people were born as far back as like 1760, some of the people in the um, 1841 census, I'm really pleased with that. But between that and seeing their family members and the censuses and everything. I'm up to right now 
I'm probably linking about 90% of the people, which I'm just thrilled about, and probably about 85% of them as uh, that I feel are highly likely are really good links. So I'm I think that will give me uh, yeah, a whole of uh, mileage. The ones I'm having a problem. It's not a big problem. Um, it turns out some of my big immigrant uh, ones are big families. They're pretty easy to find because there's lots of kids and there's often some decent public trees out there that kind of point you to where these people might have gone off to. The vast majority stayed very local, incredibly local, in fact. But, um, but for those who went further, the ones I'm having problems with are the young, young single people because in Devon, in 1840, 1860, farm service was still huge. Every kid as a teenager went off to do farm service somewhere. And they were just single, and they might not be in the same parish. They, they wouldn't be far, but, you know, if you named John Martin or William Rice, like everybody else down there, uh, <laughs> it was pretty hard to find. And then if they immigrate, it just feels almost impossible to find young single people. And if they're girls, I'm in real trouble because a lot of them will marry. And if they marry overseas, that's really hard. I'm, I am using the... Canadian American censuses, but I am struggling desperately. I think some of them went to Australia, and I just cannot find uh, records no. in that time frame for migrants um, there. No. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Yes. That's yeah. <laughs> that's great. Um, I'll move on to your next little bit uh, before we go on to to Kim talking about the context that she's been been working with. Um, did anyone else want to chip in at this point? No. Not me. Okay. All yours, Kim. We'll okay, move you so, on. So we've talked a bit about this, I think, at the last hangout. But talking about context for our study, obviously we started with population. And we've talked about his top, and I think we've talked about, at least briefly, some of the um, sites in other countries that offer population information. So I had this chart. Uh, you've seen this if you move on to the next one. And what I did was I started to break down and look at what was happening in the parishes uh, surrounding Bratton for Belly to see was this just Bratton for Belly or was it uh, you know a broader trend. And you can see from this chart, although Bratton Pavelli is the dark black line on the bottom, I, I don't know why it sits quite at the bottom, but they're all doing the same thing. They had, they were rising at the beginning of the century, uh, like every place else in England, uh, you know, were getting population rise, but then they all started defining by, certainly by um, the middle of the century. But really, in about 1840 was the peak for, for most of them. So this was in a district, and then if you go to the next one, I just looked at it in a couple can I, other can I just say before I move on, Kim, that um, for the benefit of those who haven't heard us all speaking before, um, Kim and I both have fairly similar one places. Um, mine is further north in Devon than hers, and my pattern would, would be very similar to that. Uh, I'm just wondering what on earth is going on in Ashbury to make it have those funny peaks. Is, is this a boundary change or something? Well, you, you know, we have the Ashbury. Okay, I mean, uh, the Ashbury, number one, Ashbury is really tiny. Okay, it's yeah. got, like, I don't know, 10 or 20 people at the beginning of the So century. a couple of people's going to make yeah. a big difference. But then, the big it? thing that happened for it later in the century is that's where they put in the railway station. Uh, of course. Yeah, now yes. it's closed now, but the station's still there. Somebody has a really nice home at that station now. Uh, but yes, that made all the difference for little uh, But it just shows that you need to not just make pretty charts, but you need to use those as a basis for questioning about what's going on in that place. And to compare that in this way, particularly as they're, they're adjacent parishes, you suddenly see an anomaly there and start to think, what's going on and, and and you knew the answer which is brilliant so okay yeah, the other thing oh, goodness. I'd recommend if you go back to that just a second the other thing I'd recommend is that look around for any 
uh, local books in your local studies library or at the record office or, or just your public library because uh, we found, as, and Janet knows this, that a fellow back in the 60s, I didn't know this because he put the place under a fictitious name to kind of protect the village from much attention, but uh, there was a book that he did a bunch of research in Ashbury and North Lou that is right next to my parish, and so I have found out that uh, a lot of things that I can now use as a comparison with what I'm finding in Bratton Cavelli. So do look around for local books and publications. There you anyway, go. Yeah, on the next chart, uh, I then, you're not going to see the detail of this, but I saw that some of my guys were taking jobs in mining and in the middle of this century, uh, it was going big down in Cornwall, but Devon, uh, there was a big find on the edge of Dartmoor in Devon as well. And there was uh, some mining around, so my guys were all ag laborers, but I found that some of them were going, so I thought I'd see, was anything different going on in the strictly agricultural parishes that are near my place versus the parishes where there was mining? His top if any of you are using that for population statistics, is also giving some hints on this and saying, oh, quarry operations uh, opened up in this place, or the mining operation, magnesium mining, shut down here. And what I found was they're all still declining eventually, but it looks to me like the mining parishes lasted a bit longer. So they kind of took their decline slightly later, uh, started their decline slightly later, and kind of save people probably for a couple decades. So I found that interesting. And I mean all you need to be able to all you need to be able to do this is to get the population figures. So wherever your place is worldwide, providing you can get population figures for A your place and B some surrounding places, yeah. it's possible to do the sort of thing that Kim's done should you should you wish to. Yeah. So I'm thinking, Peter, that with your Hearn Bay coming up, it, the arrival of the railway and the, the boosting of the holiday trade and people starting to actually take holidays is going to make huge differences to what's going on. Oh, yes. I mean, my, uh, my outgoing uh, research in, in the rails is very similar in the population flats on things. Um, I think all the round is a peak and then the turn after that. But in uh, Home Bay, um, this increase was very much um, actually more to do with the making of the piers. Right. Um, the first pier there appeared in 1830 and bringing the steamships from London with passengers who wanted to spend the day. Um, so this used to be a holiday trade. And, uh, books, um, hotels, uh, cafes and pubs to cater for that trade. And so um, each each pier lasted about 30 years before um, it was beginning to decay and collapsing. And the trade then collapsed until they moved enough money to build the next pier. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> Uh, the population runs along with the state of the pier. Ah. Yeah. Excellent. Unusual. Okay, um, I'll move on to, to Kim's next little thing. And then this one, I had separated out the boroughs, which if any of you have tried to track down population for the boroughs using his pops, it's, it's not easy because they keep changing boundaries and originally they're like parishes and a couple parishes in a borough or a town or a city then it's in, in, in alphabetic order or sometimes at the end of the county so I got pretty far I think uh, Launston I finally gave up by not at 1901 but <laughs> the top line is big old Plymouth which was just going great guns the middle line the orange line is England and then uh, the other of boroughs in, in the area that I'm in uh, were below that. And it was funny, Oak Hampton, uh, the purple line, also grew some. And again, I think that they attributed that, attributed that partly to the market 
but also partly to the railway. So I'm not exactly sure why that should have taken off more than they have a stock, but uh, but they did pretty good. And then there's I've just put Bratton Savelli back on there to just to show what's sitting on the bottom. So, mm -hmm. but anyway, so you want to take a look at the different types of places around around your your place because they may be doing quite different things. And that was it for population. Now and you have transport. Yeah, and then transport I took a look at. Bratton Pavelli has a real simple road system. <laughs> and has had for, I think, probably 1,000, 1,500 years at least. So it's just got like a crossroads and not much more. And you can see that in 1809, and I think those things have been there forever because some of this stuff on here was, was there in Anglo-Saxon times. So the only thing that changed transport-wise over that following century was that the railway came into Ashbury. But if you go to the next slide, Janet, the railway then was taken away. So, so it goes back to looking like it was. And the only difference now is that <laughs> one of the ancient roads down at the bottom of the map is now a motorway. Um, is it the only one in Cornwall or <laughs> one of the few? Uh, well, it, I mean, it, it isn't it's quite the classified as a motorway, is it? But it's near, it's it's a huge it's trunk a road, 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 isn't it? Um, yeah. Dual carriageway, yeah. 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 But it is a significant road in this part of the yeah. part of the world, isn't it? But so, interestingly, uh, yeah. interestingly, you see the little road coming down from Brighton to Valley to that motorway. It really doesn't connect up there and it still takes about 10-15 minutes of winding through back roads to get into Brighton to Valley, <laughs> even with uh, the, uh, the A30 there. So anyway, yeah. that uh, is it. Uh, so my transport investigation is probably a bit easier than uh, what most folks are going to have. And for this kind of stuff, I just took the maps and just kind of freehand drew a drew some lines on it with a little drawing program. So this stuff is is uh, is pretty simple to do. You just want to spend your time looking at what's happening with the transport more than um, how to make it uh, look nice. But anyway, so that's uh, what I've done on context so far. I've got lots more to do. I've got to find out. And I never find this easy, but I want to find out a lot more about the, the white wages of the agricultural laborers. And I believe in the Southwest, they weren't the greatest, you know, compared to the rest of the, um, the country. And I want to find out if there were, I know there were some downturns in the woolen industry, but I don't think that really affected my parish. They were just busy raising cattle and sheep and, you know, growing growing hay and stuff, but um, mm -hmm. I got to find ways to find out a lot more about what was happening um, in terms of the, of the agricultural climate in my part of the uh, world. That will make a difference to um, who's going to be wanting to come there and who's going to be wanting to leave. People tend to have this, this idea in their heads that people are going to come into a place or go away from a place in nice neat concentric circles so that you're going to get people equally from north south east and west but when you actually look at it and in a minute we've got some little maps with arrows on you can see that that doesn't happen and a lot of that is to do with the geography and where the roads go and things like that so I mean you're you're not far from the moor so people are far less likely to traipse across a moor than they are to come down a nice nice dry track <laughs> people don't always I've done think some of it in those terms. Too. Um, and the other thing, uh, I've done some thinking about that, plus I've got some ideas in terms of context. The other thing I'm trying to do is to read everything I can get my hands on of any studies that have been done in this area of the world, or even about, it could be in other parts of England, uh, but in, say, the period um, of the mid-19th century. And I'm trying to just get as much understanding and ideas as I can about what was going on both in terms of migration within the country as well as overseas migration, which should help me to know the things that I need to investigate further. 
and we should perhaps say at that point, Kim, that if anyone's watching this um, as a member of the Society for One Place Studies, if you go to the specific part of the website, and it's in the members area where we've set up pages for the shared endeavour, there is quite an extensive resources list there, which will include quite a bit of the sort of background material, books and articles that Kim's referring to. Obviously, it doesn't include everything. If you're there with some wonderful resource that we haven't put on there, just drop us an email and tell us and we can add it. Uh, but it does give quite a wide range of material about migration, immigration, immigration of, of all kinds there. And some of the things on there are great, like uh, local population studies is just one of my favorites. And I think another one, Janet, is like an agricultural history review. Or, yeah. And those are easily accessible, but there's other things that aren't. And at least for the next few months, I still got access to uh, university resources and stuff. So if somebody sees an article on there that they can't get, please just let us know, and, and you know, there may, we may be able to, to get a copy. Yeah, we would also quite welcome uh, resources of that type that deal with places outside the United Kingdom. Uh, because obviously Kim and I are trying to head up this project, but we're both based in the UK, despite Kim's accent, um, and that's where our expertise lies. And although we've tried really hard to bring in things from countries where other people have their one-place studies, you know, that's not where we've got a great body of knowledge. So we're really relying on other people to help us out there. Yeah, Kim, do you want to talk us? Yeah. Want so, to talk us through how you've identified people then? The other part is identifying these. We talked about the record linkage. We can move on from there. So what I found in looking at the comparing the 18 people who were there in the 1841 census to the 1851 census, and this was when my population dropped 20 percent in one decade, which is pretty steep. I found that less than one third of the parish was the same in in, in both those censuses, which was quite Gosh. shocking to me. So, Peter, it was interesting. It's going to get more interesting in 1851 to 61 at a time when, at that time, my population didn't change up at maybe 1% from 1851 to 61. But I got the same thing happen then as in 1841 to 51. I've only got like a third of the people <laughs> who are remaining the same. Mm. The population dropped, and then I took a look at births exceeding deaths, which meant the natural uh, increase, it was still on the rise. So we were getting basically, the explain, explaining that drop of 20% meant you had to lose 20% of the people, plus, you know, all those new, you know, births mm. that exceeded deaths to, to take that kind of drop in population. What were the big changes? Well, obviously, births, deaths, and marriage. There was a lot, a huge amount of local movement, and I think it had been going on long before 1841, for yeah. jobs, and that was mainly the tenant farmers, the farm servants, the agricultural laborers. There was obviously a lot of local movement of all those family members and when the head of household moved, so you had all the children going everywhere. And, it, and I saw today in an article, I think, they, in that article, they were referring to it as kind of circular migration, but circular or cyclical migration that's going, none of it gets too far, maybe, you know, within five, six, seven miles of the of Brighton Valley, but just a massive amount of movement as if there are no parish boundaries. You just kind of move around to where, where uh, you get your next piece of land or you get your next a service contract or, or, or you know, wage labor for the agricultural labor. So that's been really interesting. 95% of my moves were within the county and, and most within, certainly within 10 miles, if not 5 miles. Uh, only 4% went on to Cornwall, which was is, is actually only about 10, 15 miles away from my parish, so that really wasn't that big a move either. And then I also found, and I think this figure is going to go up, is uh, at least 5% of the parish emigrated, and they mo mostly went to Canada. So if we go to the next chart, Janet, uh, I think I've got a little summary. Some, Yeah, you can't really see it, but I've just tried to, 
if not the numbers, numbers are going to change anyway because I'm going to make my linkage better and I'm going to make my statistics better and all these things that I'm going to get around to next month. But um, just to try and keep things organized, I just have started kind of classifying the different kinds of moves. And as I say, the numbers will change, but the idea is to be able to explain uh, you know, what's happened with everybody. One of the things you'll see on there, you may not see it, is I've got people who disappear after 1841. And in this chart, I had about 150 that I have out with no information. I haven't found found them yet. And I'm improving that a little bit, but I still think it's going to run about 10% at least. And then I've got some people showing up. Um, uh, and I, and I don't know where they came from either. So I've got I'm, I've got probably you know about 200 people there who I don't really know where they came from or where they went to. But uh, we'll keep working on that. Still, that means I got about eight or nine hundred people who I do have a good idea of what happened to them, and it's going to help me uh, to go in eventually and analyze all the whys and wherefores of what happened to them. Yes. Sorry, Susie? No, I didn't say anything. Oh, right, okay. Um, I was just thinking that, I mean, obviously it's going to vary tremendously from place to place with circumstances and be very different from rural areas and towns, but it would be interesting to come up with some kind of idea about what a, a good figure is to be able, say you're looking for uh, you are comparing, let's say, let's ignore 1841 for a minute because that's always a little bit difficult, but say you're comparing 1851 to 1861 and you've got 100 people to disappear uh, and you've got to either find them somewhere else in the country or somewhere abroad or dying and I'm wondering what would be considered to be a, a good success rate with that, you know, with finding them. When I did mine, it was before quite so many censuses were searchable online and I think and, and some of my places are fairly similar to Kim's and I think I was getting between I think the lowest success rate if you see what I mean was I found 65 percent but I was getting up to to 85 percent um, now if I went and redid that now I would expect to find more because there are more census indexes available to me that can be searched on a national basis but I don't know what, you know, at what point do you think oh, I'm never going to find these? I give up now, and, and, and what sort of percentage level one might realistically expect in a well, different kind of area? You need to keep in mind a few things. Uh, one thing is uh, you might expect that, but uh, you've got this residual here. So one thing is, first of all, you have to know that you've got a good spelling of the name. You kind of stumble on finding out just how many of these people really didn't know their birthplace. And with all this local movement, loads of them didn't really know their birthplace and might no. be the birthplace of a, of a sibling. You've got old people. Oh, goodness gracious. Their ages sometimes are off by decades. Okay? And you mm -hmm. find out when they you see their burial record three years later, no, they really weren't 65. They were 85 or vice versa. Yeah. Okay, so you've got that kind of thing going on. You've got girls marrying. Okay, now it's fine if they marry locally, and it's fine if you can uh, get the parish register, but you've got to try and find out who were their parents and place them. And then you've got all these people named John Martin and William Rice and everything that there's two or three born in 1829 in Bratton Favelli alone, and trying to figure out which one belongs to whom because they're all farm servants and none of them are living with their families. Yeah. So there's an awful lot that there comes a point on some of them I say, well, I don't really stand a chance. I've got ten possibilities here for who this person might be. And I'm not going to just guess at it. And I think what also makes a big difference to your success rate if you're trying to track people who've left a place but other, hopefully still going to turn up somewhere else in the country in a census is actually the name of the birthplace and if it's yes. the sort of name that is going to be easily corruptible particularly when a person moves to an area where that place name is unfamiliar and I'll, 
be absolutely honest, one of my one places was chosen largely on that basis because I wanted to do it for an academic exercise and I wanted a small rural inland parish in Devon or in North Devon which I found and I, I had you know several to choose from and I just chose one that I thought at least the beginning of the the place name wouldn't get corrupted but obviously if you're doing this from a slightly different point of view which is it's more normal that you choose a place because you love it or you have connections with it then you're stuck with the name whether it's going to be one that's easy to find or not um, and, and you're actually in a little bit of a disadvantage with Bratton Clavelli in the same way as I am with Buckland Brewer um, in that it gets confused with Clavelli Clavelli and Buckland I mean there's five five or six Bucklands just in Devon and if you lose the Brewer bit of Buckland Brewer I'm I'm stuck um, so yeah so I, I, I think that makes a difference I'm, I took, yeah, I'm beginning to consider it almost a miracle if somebody actually put Bratton Covelli, not just Bratton, not Braddon, uh, and then spells Covelli right. I mean, I can't really use census grades. If I'm picking up a third, I, I'd have to count it someday, but if I'm even picking up a third of my people who are census grades from, from the term Bratton Covelli, I'd be lucky. It's yeah. just not very usable. And, Every manner of spelling comes about in every manner of abbreviation, and then part of them say they're from German to the anyway, you know, or North Blue or something. <laughs> and then on top of it, the other thing that really fouls you up is what people do with their ages. It's not just the elderly people. Uh, men and women who marry, if, if the woman's older than the man, often those ages change. Both the guys goes up and the girls goes down. Um, older uh, men and women who stay in farm service and stay single, a lot of those ages are off. And when you are trying to find a halfway common name and then you're five years off on the birthplace and maybe two miles off, I mean five years off on the uh, estimated birth and, and two miles off on the parish, it's really difficult. Okay. Anyway, yeah, if you just come through these other, oh, oh, and then I just drew some maps with Gen Map, and uh, I put a article in the destinations on on uh, introduction to Gen Map, so hopefully uh, folks are using some of that. To just so where people were from who were coming into the parish, and this is what Janet was talking about earlier. If you look at the on the right, it's got uh, the Branton Valley is in the middle dark green place uh, in the district of Oakhampton, but it really has a, a bias uh, towards southwest uh, in migration, and you'll see out migration. And Janet, I think you've noticed that too. And yes. in North Loo, the book that I read on North Loo and Ashbury, which is just above Oakhampton, they've got the same bias. So I've been trying to think about why don't people go to North Kevin? And a geographer wrote that book on the parishes above mine and, and said the land's about the same and everything. He couldn't figure it out either. But I was looking and I realized the big catchment area for the River Tamar runs just above Bratton Pavelli. And I wondered with that Tamar, River Tamar, which is the dividing line between Cornwall and Devon and running down to Plymouth, and so big commercial area. I'm wondering if some of the draw is not over that. Yeah, yeah. I must apologise in, incidentally for slightly changing the shape of Devon and Cornwall. Um, in the translation from yeah. Kim's version of PowerPoint to mine, um, they've got a little squashed. <laughs> a bit, but the principle of the maps is the same. But but we do know that they look a little unusual. <laughs> but that's one of my great mysteries: is why that. Uh, the out migrants see the same sort of thing. They're all staying. They're all from this area just below and to the west of uh, Bratton Clavelli. Uh, the other thing you might notice too is my my migrants are not going anywhere. Uh, they're not going to London. They're not even hardly going to Plymouth. Okay, these are not people who are joining in the great urbanization of the time. No, um, and we should perhaps, perhaps explain, partic particularly for the benefit of people who are are overseas that the the general perceived wisdom is that at this time 
everybody from rural areas was flocking to big towns and actually both Kim and I have found when you look at this on an individual basis they're not doing that at all and possibly we think it's because the sort of people with the adventurous spirit who were leaving our places were actually emigrating they weren't going to London or Plymouth or Exeter um, and so actually this this sort of generalization that everybody is leaving the country for the towns as far as we're concerned it didn't happen Peter I don't know whether you found the same at what you found in Wales if you take looked at that at all I mean you said people didn't yeah. move uh, much at all but well, yes that's right you, you, you're right about the um, immigration uh, aspects but the, the migration to the big cities uh, usually took place in two or three jumps. It wouldn't happen as a, a single move. Um, you'd find people moving to another parish which was perhaps, uh, which had more opportunities for jobs, um, maybe six or seven or eight miles away, and then we'd make another jump. Uh, in my case, we'd jump from, say, Welshpool or Newtown into Shropshire. And then from there they might go to Manchester or Birmingham. Oh, okay. They call that like yeah. step migration. Yeah. Either I haven't had mm. that, I haven't seen that at all. My guys do go around in kind of circles, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I haven't seen them kind of stepping. They either like, you know, just kind of move to the next parish, or they move to Canada or Australia. <laughs> yeah, it's a big jump or a small one. And the other thing yeah. I want to say. Um, I wanted to ask if any of you had um, uh, experimented with the, uh, the commercial genealogical packages. Um, for instance, I was looking at a review this afternoon on a package called One Great Family, um, which boasts that if you put your family onto that software, then it, the package will, um, will actively look for descendants. Of uh, your family, um, from I think I think it says 250 million people on the great family tree uh, will try and link your family to that family. Uh, has anybody just tried to see if that helps the migration pattern? I use mm -hmm. a couple on ancestry, Peter, and I think with any of these things. Uh, I do get good information, uh, some information I just would never get otherwise, and sometimes there's some excellent stories and some gravestones and everything. Uh, yeah. The only thing, is, you know, if you just make the assumption that a great deal of it is, is garbage and wrong, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. you're going to have to look closely and find, but there's some very good, you know, stuff that you could never have a chance of learning. I'm, I would never learn about my overseas immigrants without that kind of thing. It's just that you have to be really careful and, and take your source as well because there is a lot of very, very wrong stuff out there. Oh, yeah. yeah. I found um, that same in family search. Um, yes. Uh, they might marry a 90-year-old with a 2-year-old or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're yeah. just crazy. People are not really sort of... Um, being careful about it. <laughs> yeah. But I think the people, there are people who source their their stuff well, and they tell you where they got their information. So on yeah. Ancestry, there's ones who link to the Canadian censuses or the overseas census or our marriage indexes and the like. Those are the ones I look for, and then uh, you know I just look and, and look for the obvious errors, like you said that there are. I have found some some really quite brilliant ones. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, some picking up on something that Peter said just now about this, the fact that people don't go from A to B, they go from A to B to C to D, um, has got a significance for studying migration because you've got to be very aware whether you're comparing a birthplace with where someone is now, which is what you tend to do when you're using census returns yeah. Yeah. for migration patterns. Or actually, are you trying to see where that person was 10 years earlier, let's say, or maybe where an intervening child might have been baptized or born to give you the clues to some of these steps? 
because yeah. it's a diff very different exercise comparing birthplace to where someone is now living to comparing where they're now living with where they were living previously and, yeah. and that, although that's more accurate it's an awful lot more work to try and track all the steps in the migration and even then I mean it, you're going to miss some because they're going to live in a place where they've left no obvious trace they haven't had any children there um, no children have died there they haven't been there for a census return and so you are going to miss those places uh, and I'm sure that in different geographical areas the ease with which you can do that is, go is going to differ and also with different time periods I mean we tend to hone in on the on the 19th century for migration because that's when we've got the best sources for studying it but actually you can study migration for any time period it's just a lot, lot more difficult certainly as far as the the UK is concerned and Janet I'm glad you mentioned that because honestly just this morning I was looking at Right now, I'm comparing census to census. So, what was it like in 1841? What's it like in 51 and 61? Yep. But I am have every plan. I've got the voter returns from 1832 on annual returns. Now it doesn't have everybody, but it's got quite a lot of folks with their residences. So a lot of the tenant mm -hmm. farmers and obviously the landowners. I've also got the tithe records. Oh, and in addition, uh, yeah, it tells the kind of land even. But I've got the tithe records of 1845, which not only give the owners but uh, again give the tenants. And I plan to, and then I, of course I've got where because I'm linking to the parish registers as well. I've got where the children were baptized, um, not necessarily born, but usually the baptism records says something about. If they weren't living in the place they were baptized, that they yeah. it. And so I have every intention of trying to see what was going on in between the censuses as well, to the extent that I can. Mm. There, there have been um, a number of scholarly articles written about how accurate it is to take a place of baptism as a place of birth. Um, and oh, not, not time to discuss it now and, and the people who've written about it don't all agree with each other just to help matters but it's it's as good as it gets pre-census um, but there are suggestions that actually particularly first children and you, know, you go back home to the bride's parents parish to baptize the first child because possibly that's where she's given birth to it and so on so but it is worth something worth um, worth considering yeah, and I'm very okay, Kim. There's your little. Yeah, I, I'm also very interested in what happens at marriage because everybody assumes that assumes that the bride moves to the groom. But I'm not convinced that's what's necessarily happening uh, in Bratton Valley. So I'm going to take a close look at that too. Yeah, this is the only other one I want to show now because we need time for visualization, which is a really fun part. Um, and I, I, I just ignore the same for 1851 to 61. But on this. It's just a listing of where my immigrants have gone. What's interesting about this is over 60% of my guys that, that I found out of this 1841 to 51 had gone to Canada at a time when really Canada was not the big destination that the U.S. was. So Janet and I have done some comparison and, and we found a lot of these places on here were places for Bible uh, where they had Bible Christian chapels, which was a very local <laughs> sort of uh, bran uh, branch off from Methodism, to um, to put it simply. So this is really interesting to me, this distribution of where people are going, and I've got a lot more work to do. But I'd like to kind of leave it at that, Janet, because I think we yeah, want to sure. do a visual. Okay. Yes, we do. Yeah, okay. I'll move on until uh, we get to your pictures then. Yeah. Um, what we've done, several people have provided us with, with pictures, basically, um, which illustrate various um, ways of visualizing your migration findings. Uh, some of them we know how they've done them, some of them we don't. Uh, so we'll just, just show you, and the first ones relate to 
just population figures really and you can see there's there's different things you can do and there's a whole load more that we haven't got pictures of here and perhaps people would like to share them in, in other ways at some point but uh, this is this is Alex's population uh, for a uh, parish in Buckinghamshire in the UK I mean she's made it look pretty but it, it's it's a bar chart and she has distinguished between males and, and females there um, so that's that's a fairly standard sort of visualization made made to look you know made to look nice and attractive um, and then she's gone on there uh, and, and added on she's interested Sorry, in Kim? that 19 I was just going to say she's interested yes. in that 1951 spike but yeah yes yeah, she is uh, and of course there's a gap in in 1941 because we didn't have a census there so it's difficult to tell which part of that 20 year gap that spike you know whether it's even or whether there's a sudden spike in the 40s or in the 30s or, or wherever and here what she's done is basically the same chit with uh, her her own county and the neighboring ones so she's looking at uh, the specific small place within the context of a, a slightly wider region that, that it is within um, and it does seem that her place is is not in line with the trend at that particular point that she was she was questioning as to, to why uh, why it was why it was so different and even again if you go back to sort of around 1881 1891 where she's got a spike but that's not really reflected in the in the regional figures um, then uh, this is just something different that you can do with population and I've just divided people into to genders and age groups for a particular census and, and we've said before that one of the reasons why one does this particularly for migration is because the, the received wisdom is the average community which of course doesn't exist will be a very regular shaped triangle um, those that go skinny in the middle round about the sort of people who are 20s and 30s are uh, communities that are losing population so like the one that Kim's been talking about if you've got a bulge in the middle there then it's probably a town that is attracting in migration uh, at a fairly rapid rate and of course just doing one of these isn't hugely helpful but if you start to do more than one either comparing your place with another place or comparing your place at different points in time then you can start to use it to make sense of things um, I did do this using Excel if you want to do the same if you just Google creating population profiles in Excel believe me something will come up and probably several things will come up uh, and it does you know they do take you through it step by step what you need to do Kim has done something completely um, uh, more elaborate it's the same thing uh, Kim, do you want to just explain a little bit what you've done here? Yeah, it, it is the same thing. It's just that I've added uh, their marital status to it, so you can see the single versus married versus mm. widowed people. This is a place Ashford Kent that got in the railway in, in, on a key line from uh, London to Dover. So that was a big deal. And then on top of it, Southeastern Railway decided to fight their locomotive manufacturing company there. So it was just bursting uh, with growth through this uh, period of time. So that's why it looks like quite a lot of young people and they were having a lot of children and, and young couples bringing in children. So mm. it's going to look very different from some of the ones we're going to see in the world process. So that actually illustrates quite well what I was saying about the bulge not only have you got the bulge in the middle indicating a, a, a receiving community but of course because those people that are coming in are of the childbearing age group you've got that very broad very broad base as well um, so that's but it's interesting to see it divided up with the married and the widowed and the single you know um, as well and it's just well, a, one, one interesting thing about the widows is Ashford and other towns I think you'll see that are growing they tend to um, probably have more developed social services and there was actually quite a number of single women and older widows and widowers who lived in Ashford that I think it's, it's 
slightly different than some of the other places. Okay, I will move on to the next one. Uh, I mean, this is instead of a map, if you want to make a little pie chart, I mean, I use Microsoft Works rather than Microsoft Word because I'm just like that. Uh, but this is this is what I did with that, and it just shows how far people had come um, into into my place or one of my places. Uh, and again, something that you can compare from time to time or from place to place. And that's it, mm. looking like a map. Um, and that was done with Archer Software's Gen Map, which is uh, only usable for um, the United Kingdom. Um, I'm just wondering how much of Scotland and Ireland it, it includes, but pretty sure it's was well, certainly Britain anyway. Um, and you can make it do all sorts of all sorts of pretty things. You'll see some more uh, things using this particular software um, it's you know, comparatively affordable um, and, and does quite a lot of nice things like that so um, this is something that Kim has done using the same software did you want to explain explain it Kim? It's really kind of like what we saw earlier where it's just showing the in, in this case I think I was looking at migrants going into Ashford and looking at how far this I happen to just be focusing on the county of Kent when I did this actually there were people coming from all over the country for all that uh, engineering work but uh, but you can do this sort of thing on GenMap really easily and, and this is one of the things that I kind of explained in that article to the um, destinations this is just another way of looking at it where I use Twin Map to uh, do the proportionate circles, which gives, gives you an idea of how many people are coming into Ashford from these different locations. And you can see how it's drawing so many people from the local area into uh, the town. In actuality, there were immigrants from across uh, uh, the UK, and they were the railway workers, but virtually all of the service workers, a lot of the tradespeople and the like, and certainly any agricultural laborers were coming from the local area. And the other thing I put on there was uh, don't forget to use tables too. It doesn't have to be charts or pictures. But uh, there's uh, ways also of, of doing calculations to show migration flows. And I'll probably do some articles in the future about some of the things like that. This tends to be a cause a standardized migration flow, which is just a way of showing how many more people are coming to Ashford from within five miles uh, than, say, from 20 miles out. Yes, we should encourage people to read your destinations article, Kim, because that does, does give a lot of ideas. Do we have any more? Yeah, these are Janet's. Now, I don't know how Janet has, has created this. I suspect she's just taken a base map and and drawn on it really, so it's it's quite you know, not not hugely complicated to do, um, showing people coming in or out of her place, and again there it's slightly slightly more sophisticated, taking a, a wider area. But if you look at Janet's um, website, these these she said take them off my website, so I did, and thank you Janet. Um, so you can see more of what she's done. On there, but it is a good idea to see how other people have done things to help you decide what would suit you and, and equally what wouldn't suit you because what's appropriate for one person's research is, is not um, necessarily appropriate for another. And I was just thinking, Kim, that to compare what you've done for Ashford, which I know you did for a sort of an academic exercise rather than a specific interest, for, to compare that with Peter's Hearn Bay, which Again, for the benefit of, of people who aren't familiar with the geography, is a coastal town within the same little bit of bit of England. Um, yeah. that, that might be some interesting comparisons there. Yes, yeah, so and looking at that with interest, um, you know, we split the, the registration districts. Um, so mine is in the district of Green. Yeah, and also, I was going to say that um, mine. 
translation I've really looked at it very briefly, but looking at this, the 1911 census um, of where people came from um, or were born uh, to make the distinction, uh, it looks like they came from all over the country and this probably because uh, Hern Bay was a commercial venture and it was born out of uh, um, commercial uh, opportunity, if you like. Um, and so it's my guess that the, the place was advertised all over the country uh, for people with a bit of spare cash to buy a plot of land there. So this would have helped to um, for the migration, it would have helped to diversify very, very broadly. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Interesting comparison that one. Um, okay, Kim, this is here. If you ever want to chat more about it, um, you know where to find me. <laughs> yeah, I really like this stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> so do I. Yeah. And, and this is a, the great benefit, and one of the, the reasons why we wanted the society to run as it does, to be able to to exchange information in this way and I think that's, you know, we seem to be doing that really rather well. Um, this is a, a different software, Kim. Um, if, you want to do worldwide, if you want to do worldwide stuff, you're not going to get that off GenMap. And actually, I think GenMap does very well with Scotland and Wales. I, I think for Ireland, my recollection is there's not registration districts there, but for the British Isles, GenMap I, I just love. But worldwide, you can't do it. And I, this I did this one quite a long time ago with Matt, my family tree, which works fine. But I also want to check out Family Atlas, which I think has a lot of features. But there's several of them out there, so you just have to pick the ones appropriate. There may be ones for uh, the U.S., Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, or the like that maybe go down to lower uh, registration type districts or other sorts of, uh, of um, uh, divisions that make sense in those countries. So if people do know good packages for places outside the British Isles, please speak up. Yeah, review them for us or, or something, it'd be great. Um, and this is the same software, isn't it, Kim? It is, and this one was, I. you can group things. You can group things on GenMap, too. Um, this one you can set filters and just look at particular time frames or look at, say, particular surnames or places. And in this case, I was trying to look at the progress of these migrants across uh, the states over time. So the stuff in red was dating BC and then the blue, they got that far by 1900 and then it took until 1950 to get out to California. So I just think there's just... These, these packages are not hard. You don't have to be a mapping expert. You, you may have to play with them a little bit and see, see what they offer. Uh, but you can do an awful lot and be picked an awful lot without having to spend a whole bunch of time you know, learning, learning software. And, and perhaps we should say that we are hoping that our next Hangout on Air in May will be about mapping. So keep an eye open for that, for that one. Mm -hmm. And there's your, your little chart, Kim. The only point of this one was, look, you don't have to do fancy stuff to visualize your information and to be able to convey it to others. You can use a table. In this case, I just used a little table in Excel. <clears throat> I found one little button on Excel that tilted it and gave it a nice shadow and some nice colors and a little border. <laughs> uh, you don't have to do fancy stuff to be able to come up with ways of getting across your point uh, quite more directly to people. Lovely. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm going to um, stop my screen share now while we, we finish, our, finish our discussion off. Um, so just bear with me for a moment. Yes, OK, I'll save it. <laughs> Right. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, okay. Well, we're we're sort of coming to the end of our session now, so I'll just give people in the room a 
chance to summarise you know, what we've done so far. Um, Susie, I know you're you're here on a technical basis. Susie isn't <laughs> deliberately not saying anything. She's she's our, our technical person. Um, but would you like to make any comments? Not really. I haven't managed to get to an awful lot of grips of uh, migration into my place. Um, some of the reasons that I have found, though, are either they were e exported to the colonies against their will, <laughs> yes. um, and some of them actually left after um, mishaps with the police where they spent some time in jail, and then when they came out, obviously didn't want to live amongst the community that had put them in there, <laughs> and so ran off to London. <laughs> so uh, there's all sorts of different reasons why people come into and go out of places. It's not just the either following a trend, like a national trend, mm. or even just as a result of waves of immigration in or out of the place. It can be just little personal decisions. That's why I, I personally like to look at it on an individual level because mm -hmm. you, otherwise you get this sort of meaningless average um, and, and you don't really know what's what's motivating different people. So that's my my personal kind of take on yeah. it. Um, Peter, your turn to summarise. Well, yes, I've got an awful lot more to do and, you know, a few good um, yeah, good ideas from this session. Good. And I shall be pursuing them vigorously as soon as I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, people out there watching either in real time or, or later on, do feedback, do share ideas that you've got. If you think, oh, they were talking a whole load of rubbish, that's never going to work. You know, it, tell us what you think and through one of our on methods of communication, the forum, Facebook, through destinations, will allow you to write blogs, all sorts of things. So, you know, there are there are ways of keeping in touch because if you're sitting there thinking, this is I've got this brilliant idea and they haven't said it, unless you tell us, <laughs> nobody's going to know what your brilliant idea is. So we would welcome sharing and feedback. Yeah. Um, Kim, thank thank you for taking the lion's share of the work tonight. Um, is there anything you'd like to, to leave us with? I just want to hear from people. I want to hear what people are doing. I want to learn from what's going on out there. So please share what you're up to. Find some some way, however you're comfortable sharing. It would be really great. But there's a lot, lot to learn, and I think I think there's a lot that people know about that I'm never going to have a chance to to even hear unless somebody speaks up. Okay, well, well, we'll wind up now then. Thank you very much for taking part or watching or participating in whatever way you, you are. Um, we will be having more Hangouts, a couple more Hangouts this year, particularly about migration, but there will be ones on other topics in between. So do join in with them in whatever way you feel comfortable. And uh, we will be putting in another couple of months and some more ideas for you to work on uh, on the members area of the website. Uh, we've, Kim and I have only just uploaded the second inspiration sheet, so you've got a little while before we bombard you with the third one. Um, so thank you very much, and we'll all say goodbye, and Susie, you can, you can take us down. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.